Um, it's a pleasure, it's a honor. So when uh, the organizers told me first uh, if I wanted to give some lectures, invited me to give some lectures about dark matter, uh, initially, as you know, I was a bit hesitant, essentially because I thought that what I could do was uh, something, uh, say, very basic, uh, starting from the basics and, uh, and uh, really directed to, to students, uh, while uh, sometimes here are courses at, uh, at a higher level. Uh, no, this is going to be very basic. So I'm starting uh, from the stuff from the from the bottom, and essentially, you might have uh, never heard about uh, dark matter, and uh, probably uh, you will uh, learn uh, something at the end. So this is the reason. Well, of course, at the end I accepted, and this is the reason I gave to to Ricardo for accepting to give the lectures. But actually, the other reason, the most serious one, is that uh, uh, I'm supposed to lecture by dark mat on dark matter, but I don't know what I'm talking about. Right, so this is the actual problem, that uh, nobody knows what this stuff is, uh, what dark matter is, uh, and uh, we are talking about um, nothing in some sense. I mean, we have no clear ideas. So that means uh, essentially that uh, uh, these uh, lectures will be, uh, so since I don't know what I'm talking about. Can you read my handwriting? Is it OK? Yeah. Mm? Almost. Yeah. <coughs> I'll try to improve uh, as I go on. So that means uh, that uh, uh, there are three colors to this uh, statement. Uh, the first one is that these lectures will be essentially biased, meaning uh, that uh, uh, maybe some ideas uh, look good today, uh, I mean, this period of uh, physics history. But then uh, in a few years, they will be completely uh, completely forgotten uh, if we discover something else or we find out the actual uh, good answer. But now they look good, so we'll spend some time on these and maybe it will be completely uh, uh, ill-placed. The second corollary is that these lectures will be incomplete in the sense that uh, the truth is not known yet, again, so if um, I might be missing something relevant and, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, not my fault in some sense. And the third corollary is that uh, these uh, lectures will be essentially axed uh, on uh, um, phenomenology and uh, uh, tools, so things uh, which might turn out useful uh, in different contexts, uh, independent, uh, independent of what uh, uh, dark matter really is. Yeah, first uh, question. I said may that I suggest the fourth point, uh, uh, yeah. no money back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So your mileage may vary, and there is no, no um, reimbursement if you're not satisfied. <coughs> OK. So with that, uh, people can leave if they want. If not, uh, let's, uh, let's start. Should I, shall I leave the first sentence? No. Yeah. Maybe it's better to remove it. OK. So <coughs> uh, there, at some point, I will erase uh, the website of the, of the sure, yeah, I forgot. Okay, I'll leave it there. The website has uh, the links to the this record, video recording. It will be online beginning of next week. Otherwise, it is a YouTube at IPHT TV. Okay, so uh, the way I want to start this uh, is uh, so the, the, the program is actually outside, uh, written on the, um, on, the, on the announcement. But um, and so today, essentially, we will talk about uh, the basics again, so the evidences and why we know, how we know that dark matter real exists in the universe. But before going into that, uh, I will spend the first 10 minutes or so uh, giving you the conclusions. So let's say at the end of this, uh, of this uh, course of five uh, meetings, um, what will we uh, know in some sense? So let's say that this is uh, the executive summary, so something that uh, if you are very busy and if you don't want to pay attention uh, to all the details, uh, should uh, stay uh, with you, uh, uh, say, for forever. <coughs> so the first uh, statement, these are sort of safe statements, I think, uh, uh, with some degree of uh, assumptions behind, but I'm trying to, to, be, to be slow and introduce one, uh, one after the other. So the first statement uh, is that uh, dark matter exists. Okay, so we don't know what it is. It's, uh, uh, a substance that fills, uh, fills galaxies and the universe, and uh, as we will see in a, in a moment. Uh, but it, I think uh, there is no, uh, no way in which the phenomena that we attribute to dark matter can be uh, overthrown or uh, shown to be, uh, say, fake in some sense. Mm -hmm. no. 
we don't know what's the nature of the thing, but that something exists and uh, is uh, creating this effect that we see is pretty, pretty sure. So <coughs> we also were pretty sure, and now let's say with the confidence level uh, slightly lower than, uh, than that, uh, that uh, it's uh, so dark matter, whatever it is, uh, it is uh, a corpuscule. So I hope I'm writing, uh, I'm good, I, the spelling is right. So uh, uh, it's uh, a, an object mm, which uh, behaves uh, like uh, matter. So what I mean by this, uh, behaves like matter in uh, the evolution of the universe. So essentially with this, uh, I mean that uh, it d evolves, uh, its density evolves uh, as one over the volume of the universe as the universe expands. Mm. So this A is uh, the scale factor of the universe. Later, I will give you some uh, basic formula for cos on cosmology because we will need them later. But <coughs> for the moment, this is just to say that uh, this uh, substance, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, has uh, the property that its density dilutes uh, as one over the volume of the universe as the universe expands, exactly as you expect uh, from something that you call uh, matter or a corpuscule or dust mm, or something like that. Now, this is, in uh, some sense, uh, certain. A a next step is to say that maybe this is uh, rather a particle, so a fundamental particle of some sort. So now we are entering in the, in the domain of particle physics. So this uh, is uh, an extra assumption. So not necessarily this must be an extra uh, uh, particle coming from particle physics. Uh, we'll see examples of uh, mac macroscopic corpuscles, and we'll see many examples of uh, uh, actually new fundamental particles. But <coughs> again, let's say that a particle fulfills uh, this uh, this uh, requirement, uh, so it's a good candidate for being dark matter. So if this is the case, uh, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a particle, then uh, it must be a new and currently unknown particle in the sense that uh, uh, the any particle which is in the standard model uh, cannot fulfill uh, the uh, properties uh, that I will uh, discuss later. So it must be a new ingredient uh, beyond the, of physics beyond the standard model. Okay, <coughs> so up to now there should be no surprise for you. Then we can measure, so we don't know what this stuff is, but we can measure its uh, abundance uh, very precisely. So we know that it uh, makes up uh, <coughs> on the, the scale of the whole uh, universe 25.8%. Uh, Later I will give more precise numbers, but for the moment this is okay. 25.8% of the total energy of the universe, total energy total matter energy budget of the universe, which corresponds uh, also to 84% of the matter content of the universe. Mm -hmm. So this uh, is measured by cosmological probes, so essentially uh, Planck, uh, WMAP earlier and then uh, Planck uh, most recently. So the, the precise numbers uh, are nowadays uh, that uh, omega dark matter multiplied by h squared is equal to, if I take the latest uh, Planck uh, value, 8.11.85.86 plus or minus 0.0020. Right. So this, this is from uh, uh, the latest results uh, from the Planck uh, satellite 2015, <coughs> I think. So uh, this is uh, so. This is the quantity which is usually quoted. So omega dark matter times uh, uh, h squared. H square is the reduced Hubble constant. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, uh, a let's say Hubble today. The, the Hubble constant today is 100 times uh, this quantity H. <coughs> and roughly it equals, uh, so equals like roughly equal to 0 0.7 in units uh, of uh, uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. I think, yes. So now this, uh, the precise value for this is actually currently subject of debate. It might be 67, it might be 72, depending on the different probes. Uh, for our purposes, it's not particularly important. Uh, so this is the uh, central value in some sense. And uh, omega dark matter instead is defined. So for the current purposes, you can think of omega as uh, the fraction of uh, the substance, uh, dark matter in this case, uh, over the total uh, content of the universe, uh, so the percentual, percentual fraction. So indeed, uh, you see that if I multiply, if I put here the value of uh, 0 0.7 to the square, I get to this number here, 25, uh, 26%. Uh, percent. Mm. 
So technically, um, well, I will define, uh, well, let's say, let's define it immediately. Omega x for a certain uh, fluid uh, x, in this case I'm talking about dark matter, is defined as the energy density for this fluid x divided by the critical density <coughs> of the universe, where the critical density of the universe itself is defined as 3h divided by 8 pi g, where g is the Newton constant. H square, yes. Uh, so essentially, uh, omega is the fraction of the total, and we are saying that this is 25% uh, of, the, of the total energy. Now, um, a part of this matter, so this is dark matter, this is the value for dark matter, but the part for the, of this matter is uh, in form of baryonic matter, so I can also measure something which is called omega baryon uh, h squared and since uh, and from the same uh, from the same probes uh, so Planck uh, in particular and this turns out to be 0. Point zero uh, omega baryon 22 26 plus or minus 0. 0.0023 I think no 0, 0, 0, 0.0023 okay Maybe you can check later. So I, I'm writing these numbers just to show that, uh, uh, well, first uh, that there is a, a clear, uh, if there is a ratio between uh, the amount of matter which is in the form of dark matter and the amount of matter which is in the form of baryons, and this will be useful later, so let me write it down here. Omega baryon divided by omega dark matter, so the ratio between the two turns out to be of the order of uh, 5, 5 to 6, say, 5.4 given this latest uh, measurement. So the two kinds of matter that we have in the universe, baryonic um, and uh, dark matter, are roughly proportional, are roughly, say, in the same amount, same quantity. Mm? It's a factor of order one, in some sense. It's not uh, much less, it's not uh, uh, much more for one of the two. And also, I'm writing down this number to show that uh, we can measure, despite the fact that we don't know what we are talking about, uh, so what this substance is, uh, we can measure its density very, very precisely. So with an, er level, uh, with an error at the level of uh, less than 10% or so. Mm. so what, why is variance special? Hmm? About, what's special about taking variance? About variance? Uh, so this will be essentially the, uh, the, 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 the content of this, uh, of this lecture today and possibly at the beginning of the next one. So essentially, Okay, when I, take, when I say baryons, what I mean is essentially protons, uh, neutrons, so standard, uh, standard matter, and electrons, I put all of them together. So electrons do not contribute significantly to the mass because they are much uh, lighter. So essentially I'm talking about uh, neutrons uh, and uh, protons. So what's special about this, uh, this, this, um, uh, this kind of matter here is that essentially it couples to photons, while uh, this other quantity here, this other kind of matter here, does not couple to photons, which defines, uh, in some sense, the word dark, which is what I'm going to discuss next. Mm? Ah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so omega dark matter is uh, 10 times larger than omega baryon. So there are five times more dark matter than baryons. Mm? On average, in the, whole, uh, in the whole universe, we'll see that in given systems, uh, the, the ratio might be, might be very different. So um, I'm obliged to to show, so I'm giving these numbers here, but I'm obliged to show the, the, the usual common bear of the, of the content of the universe, which is made more or less like this. So you have, if this is the total energy content of the universe, you have more or less that 1% only, or even less, is in the form of luminous matter. So here I'm a bit sloppy, I'm just putting numbers just to give you an idea, but roughly speaking, 1% is in the term of, is in the form of luminous matter. 4%, so slightly more, is in the form of, uh, say, ordinary baryonic matter which does not shine. So you can think of uh, clouds of gas or black holes or uh, lost planets, uh, uh, dead stars and stuff like that. So stuff that we know and we, we know what it is, but it's uh, just not uh, shining light. Then I have this 26%, uh, what I talked about, uh, which is in the form of dark matter. And then I have the rest, uh, which is, if the, my computation is correct, 69%, uh, which is in the form of uh, dark energy, which is uh, even uh, more uh, mysterious, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it uh, at all. So maybe since we are going, uh, this is, the latest, me this is uh, the latest measurements coming from uh, uh, Planck. So since we are talking about uh, 
we are going about the basic things. Let me contrast uh, for a second uh, dark matter and dark energy. Mm -hmm. So the two things are completely different, right? So we're not talking at all about the same substance. And essentially, the difference uh, is uh, uh, the one of the, there are two main differences, I would say. And the, one, the first one is that uh, uh, dark matter, as I said already, behaves, uh, so it uh, dilutes uh, as uh, 1 over the volume of the universe as the universe expands. And this is uh, what you expect from uh, matter, and this matter there. While uh, dark energy, as far as we know, is essentially a constant. I mean, for all our purposes for the moment, and uh, given the latest measurements, uh, is uh, essentially close to a constant uh, under the evolution of the universe. Mm -hmm. So this essentially means that if I take a, a box of the universe and I put some ma dark matter inside, and I double the size, uh, so I, I make it double as the universe expands, if its volume becomes a double, then the density is uh, half, uh, clearly. The density, the, the dark energy instead, uh, if I put uh, some dark energy in the box of the universe, I let it expand, it becomes uh, twice as much. Uh, the density of the, of the substance, substance is the same, is constant. So the total energy content is double. Mm -hmm. So this is completely different. I'm not going to talk about this substance, I'm going to talk about uh, this substance here. The other difference, uh, that if, if you want, comes also from uh, a definition uh, of what matter does, uh, is that uh, this quantity clusters, so gravitationally, so two dark matter particles attract each other, and so lumps uh, of dark matter will form and will grow, and we will see this uh, later in, uh, in some detail. While, uh, as far as we know, um, the dark energy component probably does not cluster. So let's say it remains uh, constant and homogeneous uh, uh, as the universe expands as under no uh, gravitational uh, attraction. So this is not to say that uh, dark, dark energy does not affect uh, the formation of structures, uh, so the growing of uh, cosmological structures. So it does, uh, especially at low uh, redshift, so at later times. Uh, but certainly, it cannot be this kind of substance uh, that drives uh, the formation of structures, because you need something that uh, clusters and creates uh, and creates uh, lumps that grow bigger and bigger. So in a bit more technical terms, uh, one can say that uh, the equation of state of a substance uh, uh, called uh, dark matter, of the substance called dark matter, which is defined as uh, the pressure divided by the density of this fluid, uh, is equal to 0 for uh, uh, the dark matter, and instead uh, is equal to essentially minus 1 for the substance called uh, uh, dark energy. Uh, I haven't uh, talked about cosmology at all, but you can easily see that uh, this uh, thing, this property here, uh, means uh, that this, quant this substance, this fluid, drives uh, the acceleration of the universe, uh, mm, while uh, this substance, uh, no, it does uh, only contribute to the creation of collapse of structures. Okay, <coughs> so let's go on with the statements. These are the... the, con the um, the, the numbers, uh, let me go on. With more safe uh, statements in some sense. So the next one is that uh, dark matter, whatever it is, uh, it's a neutral particle in the sense uh, of the electric charge. Mm -hmm. So it's a particle that uh, is dark because it doesn't interact with the light. Um, to be more precise, let's say that there are limits, uh, current limits, uh, on uh, the, electric, the maximal electric charge that a particle uh, can, of dark matter can have. We are of the order of millicharge or something like this. So the order of 1 uh, over 10 to the 3, uh, 1 thousandth of uh, the charge of the electron. But for all practical purposes for the moment, uh, let's consider that dark matter is a neutral, electrically neutral particle. Now, this uh, defines uh, its being dark. While, of course, uh, uh, dark also means, in some sense, uh, obscure, uh, difficult to understand, and so on and so forth. Actually, a more precise word would be transparent. Mm? So in some sense, uh, dark matter should be called transparent matter, in the sense that light goes through it without interacting uh, at all. <coughs> but let's say that dark matter is the, is the, is the current jargon. Then uh, we know from cosmology, we will see hopefully later today, that uh, dark matter has to be cold. <coughs> Or, <coughs> if you want, uh, at least uh, not uh, too warm. Mm. 
So what do I mean by cold? I mean essentially, so um, it's a very precise statement uh, that I can make in terms of its properties. I mean uh, that uh, its, uh, it's uh, momentum, so p over the mass, uh, is much smaller than 1. So it's highly non-relativistic. It's essentially non-relativistic. Momentum much smaller than the mass. Uh, at the crucial time uh, of uh, cosmology, which is uh, uh, matter radiation domain, matter radiation equality. Okay, so at this moment in time, and we will see later, uh, hopefully later today, the particle of dark matter, whatever it is, was uh, non-relativistic. So it's moved slowly with respect to the speed of light, essentially. Mm -hmm. So now, notice that this is uh, not a statement on the mass of the particle, of course. I mean, typically, let's say, if you want a shortcut, heavy particles will typically be non-relativistic because their momentum is smaller than their mass since they are very massive. But this is not necessarily the case. You can have a very light particles, uh, such as, for instance, uh, axions, which are a good dark matter candidate, which have a mass of 10 to the minus 5 electron volt, uh, say, in some uh, specific case. So really, really light. But given the way they are produced, uh, they have uh, a, an even smaller momentum. So they are produced essentially at rest, in some sense. And so they are not cold. They are uh, uh, non-relativistic at this crucial time uh, in, uh, in cosmology. As the universe expands, uh, this uh, remains fulfilled uh, because the things cool uh, and so the momentum can only decrease. And so in the end, if uh, dark matter is non-relativistic, so cold uh, at this moment in time, then it will be also cool, uh, cold uh, all, the way, all the way down. Just to be more precise, uh, this is uh, a moment in time that corresponds to redshift of the order of uh, uh, 3,400. <coughs> so say before, just before the creation of the CMB, the decoupling. Uh, uh, the formation of the CMB. We see why this is the case uh, uh, later. Next, uh, another thing that we learn uh, from, co from cosmology and from astrophysics, that we will see, as we will see later, is that uh, dark matter is uh, a particle which is uh, very feebly interacting. Okay. So very feebly interacting, where with feebly, I use this word because I don't want to use weak, because weak is, uh, is reserved, uh, at least in my, in my language, for SU2 left interaction. So it's a particle that it's uh, feebly interacting, both uh, with itself. So two dark matter particles essentially do not feel each other, except for gravity. I mean, every particle with a mass feels uh, the gravity of a particle with a mass. But other than that, uh, other kinds of interactions uh, are constrained to be very feeble, and also with ordinary matter, which I could call uh, uh, baryonic as well. So I will give uh, some uh, more detailed uh, numbers on this. What do I mean by very feebly? So there are constraints uh, from astrophysical systems uh, that we will discuss uh, later today. But this is what you should have in mind, that it interacts very uh, weakly with ordinary matter and with itself. So now sometimes this is, uh, uh, this is uh, dubbed uh, uh, collisionless. So you hear the word uh, collisionless to explain uh, collisionless to explain uh, this, uh, this concept, uh, meaning that it has essentially no collisions with itself and with ordinary matter. So now I find that this is a bit uh, um, misleading uh, because this means essentially no collisions at all. And this is not necessarily the case. As we will see later, if we hope to detect dark matter in some way, we need it to collide, uh, say, on nuclei of experiments uh, or on other, uh, on other substances. So <coughs> collisionless is a bit too strong. But for practical purposes, you can assume it's collisionless, so zero collisions at all. And you should keep in mind that this corresponds to saying that its collisions are so feeble that it can be neglected. They can be neglected. Neglected today, Not yes. In the history, uh, well, also in the history of the universe. Also in the history of the universe, yeah. So except, except for gravity, except for gravity. So I'm not talking about gravity. Eh? So gravity is out of this picture. But then uh, a substance uh, that interacts uh, very feebly is required also during the history of the universe. Well, you mean for, producti for producing it in so very producing early it and, and getting the, the well, this, but yes, but that's because you are in the framework of the thermal freeze-out mechanism for yeah. production. If you have another mechanism of production, mm, 
say it decays uh, directly from the inflaton, it can be complete zero interactions at all. Now, again, I, I was saying feebly here, but uh, it might be so a specific case uh, of the feeble hypothesis uh, is uh, weak in the sense of the SU2 left of the standard model, so uh, actually weak interactions. So weak interactions uh, enter in this category. So they are w feeble enough uh, that we can consider them, uh, we can neglect them, and so they are essentially collisionless. And indeed, the weak intera weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs, uh, are a good candidate uh, because th they share this, uh, this possibility. It's just uh, one of the, possi of the possible cases. Um, then, uh, let's go on. Another safe, uh, safe uh, requirement is that uh, dark matter must be stable. Mm. So we are talking about a particle or an object, uh, a microscopical object which is stable or at least uh, very long lived. And that essentially is because uh, uh, dark matter is a, a substance that has shaped, uh, as we will see later today, uh, the formation of the universe uh, since the early times uh, and uh, which is still around today. We see it uh, thanks to gravitational lensing in current galaxies. Uh, uh, including our own. So it's a substance that has uh, survived uh, from the early universe uh, down to today. So essentially, it must be stable, never disintegrate, like, uh, like a proton, for instance, uh, or an electron, or it has to be a very long, if it decays uh, sooner or later, it has to be a very long lifetime, which you can actually even estimate. Uh, so if you assume that it decays uh, sooner or later, the half-life uh, of the particle has to be, say, larger or much larger than uh, the age of the universe, uh, which is uh, um, something of the order of 13.8 uh, uh, billion years, uh, so 10 to the 9 uh, years, uh, right? Uh, which uh, corresponds to, if you do the computation, uh, uh, still measure from cosmology, right? Which corresponds to, uh, I think, uh, order 4 or something, 10 to the 17 seconds. So it's an extremely long lifetime, <coughs> uh, which uh, guarantees uh, that uh, the abundance of dark matter is not depleted from the early universe uh, down to today. Actually, current bounds uh, from uh, gamma rays and other stuff that we'll discuss uh, towards the end uh, improve uh, this bound a lot. Uh, it must be actually of the order of 10 to the 28 seconds or more, so much, much uh, s more stable than that. Otherwise, we would see uh, gamma rays uh, coming from uh, regions uh, dense of dark matter. But from the point of view of cosmology, this is the minimal requirement that you must have. Now, again, uh, another safe statement uh, is w another uh, part of the standard law. Uh, that's normal. Okay. Uh, it's that, uh, so we, we possibly, so now let's include uh, a, a possibilistic statement. Uh, so in some sense, up to here, these are sort of established facts. Uh, and now the possibility, uh, I mean, things which are not completely certain, is that possibly dark matter is a relic uh, in some way uh, from the early universe. And so this is one of the dominant uh, uh, paradigms. So by relic, uh, I mean uh, something which uh, had been produ produced uh, in large amounts in the early universe. Uh, and then uh, in the very early universe, I mean, when the uh, when the temperature was to the order of uh, the, mm, uh, more than TV or so, and then it survived uh, until today. It's not the only possibility. There are scenarios in which you produce dark matter at some point uh, in, the, um, in the history of the universe, and I will discuss uh, a, a few. But then let's say that the dominant idea in the past 50 years or so is that dark matter is something that uh, survived uh, the whole history of the universe. Uh, it was very abundant at the beginning, uh, and now in some way survived as a relic uh, from the early times. That's it, uh, and uh, we want to look for it. So uh, we, ho we want to search for it, uh, and this will cover essentially the last uh, two or three um, lectures. We want to search, uh, search for, and essentially uh, two strategies, uh, three strategies. The first strategy is called, uh, conventionally, let's call it uh, uh, direct detection. The first one, direct detection of dark matter which means essentially that uh, we look at the following process in the simplified diagrams. 
you look for a dark matter particle coming from uh, space uh, in some way, impinging uh, on, uh, say, a nucleon uh, or an atom uh, or uh, an, e an electron or some stuff uh, uh, in your detector, so made of ordinary matter. So basically, you're looking at the scattering uh, of a dark matter particle uh, that comes from space uh, and uh, goes back to space uh, on, uh, say, a nucleus in a super shielded, uh, ultra pure uh, uh, underground experiment uh, or something like that. So you would see as a signature a recoil of this nucleus here because it's hit uh, by a dark matter particle passing by. You can also try indirect detection, which uh, amounts to turning this diagram around. So you can uh, look at this process <coughs> in which uh, you have uh, dark matter and, un and dark matter, possibly anti-dark matter, too, so uh, two particles of dark matter say in the galactic halo all around us in, in empty space or whatever that find each other and annihilate uh, producing uh, a couple of standard model particles so now i have turned this diagram around and i'm assuming that they produce uh, in some way uh, standard model particles this could be i don't know electrons and positrons or a couple of gamma rays uh, or a positron um, proton and antiproton or neutrinos and antineutrinos or uh, helium and anti-helium, whatever. I mean, particles of the standard model that you would collect uh, in uh, uh, cosmic ray, essentially, experiments. And then uh, the last uh, strategy, st uh, standard strategy, is uh, colliders. So uh, let's call it uh, CS for collider searches, which essentially means uh, turning this diagram the other way around. Uh, so. I have uh, standard model particles colliding uh, and I'm producing uh, two dark matter particles or a particle of dark matter and a particle of anti-dark matter. So say at the LHC, at CERN, uh, you collide uh, protons or actually the constituents of protons, the partons inside, uh, and you produce uh, particles of dark matter. Turning around this diagram. So I'm not uh, specifying at all what's inside the blob, of course. So this is uh, the unknown physics uh, beyond, the, beyond the standard model. This could be anything. Uh, if dark matter is a supersymmetric particle, this would be uh, loops and, uh, and uh, legs of uh, supersymmetric particles. If it's uh, something else, it will contain something else. Mm -hmm. But from outside, let's say, it's pretty clear. I have particles of dark matter producing particles of the standard model or colliding over, over particles of the standard model. So that's it for the executive summary. Any, any question or? Can you produce a single dark matter particle? Sorry? Can you produce a single dark matter particle? The answer is yes, of course. A single dark matter particle. Yeah. yeah, depending on the, yeah, you can also produce a single dark matter particle, but then. Uh, if it decays. Yeah, exactly. So in the sense that uh, if this, di if this uh, diagram happens, uh, well, actually, that's a good point. I should have mentioned something here, too. If this diagram happens in this way, then uh, it might also happen in the other way. So it means that. Uh, uh, a dark matter particle can decay into two standard matter particles, uh, and then uh, you are in trouble with this. Unless uh, the rate for this process is very low, but then uh, it's also difficult to go this way. So, so typically, let's say that, uh, <coughs> let's consider this to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and also, well, in the case of uh, indirect detection, uh, People also actually consider the case of decay, indeed, uh, which means uh, that uh, this process can happen as well. So if you have a single dark matter particle that decays into standard model particles, provided that the lifetime is uh, longer than, uh, than that, and this is actually where those bounds from gamma rays that I was mentioning uh, come from. So dark matter going into gamma gamma produce possible bounds and so on. So we'll discuss some of these cases uh, much, much later. Let's say that the, for the standard law, these are the diagrams that people typically consider. OK. I go on and I change the topic, because now uh, you, you yeah. have also information from astrophysics. Sorry, say again? You have also inform some information from astrophysics, not necessarily on the uh, cosmology. Yes, so, so some of these things that I said come from astrophysics. Uh, for instance, uh, well, say, I will discuss something later from uh, clusters of galaxies, um, colliding clusters of galaxies. Uh, you get uh, an information about the dark matter, dark matter interactions. So, so how much uh, an upper limit of the cross-section 
of self-interaction for dark matter. Similar bounds come also from cosmology in the sense of the CMB and uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm not. Uh, this is this comes from different uh, different sources, astrophysics or cosmology, typically. Okay, <coughs> so now let me go on and uh, discuss uh, the evidences for the existence of dark matter. So this is something uh, again uh, pretty standard that you've heard uh, probably many times, but I will go through uh, many of them. Uh, in, s in some detail. So there are essentially uh, three things uh, that are typically discussed uh, and uh, they correspond to three different uh, scales, uh, very different scales, uh, sizes uh, of uh, objects in the universe. So let me write them down. The first one uh, is at the scale of uh, galaxies uh, and in particular spiral galaxies as we will see later and this is uh, uh, rotation curves. I'm sure you have heard of the about this uh, uh, already. The second one uh, is uh, about uh, uh, clusters of galaxies, which are uh, amounts, uh, which are um, ensembles of galaxies of the order of, uh, say, from 10 to 1,000 galaxies, um, so much larger scales. And here you have, in particular, the phenomenon of weak lensing, uh, or the, uh, say, let's call it the real theorem that we'll discuss later. And finally, the third one is, uh, let's call it uh, precision cosmology. Which essentially means uh, the formation of large scale structures uh, and, uh, uh, and the formation of the CMB. <coughs> so now, two things. Uh, first of all, the, the, the I would say the first uh, two probes, uh, especially the first one, but also maybe the second, are nowadays honestly rather anecdotal. I mean, uh, they are easy to understand uh, as evidence, as uh, proofs uh, for the existence of dark matter, but they are not really used that much uh, in terms of uh, actual computations. So they are useful and intuitive, so I will uh, describe them. But uh, I mean, for nowadays, they represent mostly curiosity in some sense. While the third one, so the, the contribution of the, the role of dark matter in the formation of large scale structure and of the CMB is actually the crucial one uh, that gives you all the precise numbers and all the most of the precise properties that I mentioned uh, above. However, it's of course uh, more intricate to understand because you have to have some uh, understanding uh, over the processes behind these, the, these two things. So we'll try to go through all of them, but remember that uh, we could even uh, get rid of these uh, and this one uh, would be the proof of existence of dark matter at the level of, I don't know, 40 sigmas, if you want. Mm. The other thing that I want to, to mention is, uh, so historically, by the way, this one is first, uh, this one is second, this one is third, and then this one is convincing uh, since the last uh, 20 years or so. Mm. So I'm not following a, a historical uh, perspective here. <coughs> Let me also talk about scales. Uh, so uh, we are talking about galaxies, clusters of galaxies, uh, and uh, cosmology, which essentially means uh, the whole universe, right? The, so the whole observable universe. So let me give you some scales uh, just to fix the ideas. When you talk about galaxies, we are talking about systems which are, like take the Milky Way. What is the size of the Milky Way? <coughs> One light year? Or uh, 2,000? You're not supposed to know. <laughs> hmm? So the actual size, uh, say, conventionally, one might say that the size of the disk of the Milky Way is of the order of 20 kiloparsecs. Uh, 20 kiloparsecs. Uh, okay, so the parsec is the astronomical unit, which uh, corresponds uh, to about uh, 60 kilo light years, uh, if you do the computation. <coughs> which, uh, so you, you might remember that the galactic center is at 24,000 uh, light years away from us, if you want to remember. So the sun is at eight minutes uh, away from us, right? Eight light minutes away from us. The galactic center is 24,000 uh, years away from us. We are receiving the light uh, that was emitted 24,000 years uh, ago, which uh, for fun I converted to kilometers and it makes uh, six, uh, 10 to the 17 kilometers, okay. So this is a typical size of the galaxy. Um, I guess uh, 
radius rather than diameter, but more or less. Clusters of galaxies, uh, we are talking about uh, indeed uh, uh, sets of uh, say up to a hundred or a thousand uh, galaxies, so they are much bigger. Uh, galaxies are, each galaxy is a part of a cluster of galaxies or superclusters and so on. So we are talking about uh, sizes of the order of uh, 1 to 10 megaparsecs, uh, roughly speaking, which uh, if you make the, comp the, the conversion corresponds to 3 times to the 6, uh, six light years. Uh, which corresponds to uh, 3, 10 to the 20 kilometers. Okay, so look at the clear scale uh, between these two things. Uh, so we are talking about some much, much bigger systems. So this size? Yeah. This is, uh, say, the, the, the typical size of a cluster of galaxies. So you can identify... The size of a whole cluster, yes. The size <laughs> of a whole cluster. So I'm just giving the sizes of the systems which are considering. If you are considering a galaxy, this is a typical <laughs> galaxy. This is the Milky Way, say. But uh, other then there are dwarf galaxies. There are much bigger galaxies. But roughly, we are talking <coughs> about the sizes. If you are talking about clusters, so a thousand galaxies uh, bound together gravitationally, typically, there are sizes of the order of a few megaparsecs. Mm. There are small ones. There are large ones. But roughly, we are talking about this. And if we are talking about uh, cosmology in general, well, that means essentially that we are looking at the whole universe, so the whole observable universe, so the, the, the Hubble volume in some sense. And if you do the computation, this uh, gives you 1.34 10 to the 4 megaparsecs, which corresponds uh, to 42 uh, giga light years. And I didn't convert to kilometers, but I leave this uh, as an exercise uh, to the to the reader. So it, I mean, it's not for fun that I wrote down these numbers. Uh, you see that there is an enormous uh, uh, hierarchy of scales uh, between a galaxy and uh, the whole observable universe, clearly. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, extremely non-trivial that uh, a simple assumption, uh, which is uh, adding uh, a new particle to the content of the universe, uh, can explain all the phenomena, but really all the phenomena that we know about, with some small exceptions, on scales, this different. So you can explain uh, something at the scale of a galaxy, and you can explain uh, the formation of uh, the whole uh, structure in the universe, uh, which differ by these uh, scales, uh, with just that simple assumption. This is non-trivial. No? So whenever people say, ah, yes, but maybe we are missing something. There is a small thing which we are not doing computationally correctly. Uh, there is a trick uh, that we are not understanding either here or here, modifying gravity or whatever, which I will discuss at some point. Fine, it, must, it might be true, but you have to explain, uh, I mean, you have to tell me how in your uh, alternative explanation uh, you can fit uh, the phenomena on all these different scales. Just adding one single particle with, its proper with these properties uh, fits the bill uh, for all these scales. So it's a, it's a non-trivial statement. Okay, so let's talk about uh, <coughs> the first uh, thing. Uh, which is uh, um, rotation curves of galaxies. So this was uh, number one, rotation curves of uh, uh, actually spiral galaxies, because this is what we are talking about. So um, I, I guess you have heard this already. But the basic cartoon idea is the following, that uh, uh, spiral galaxies, uh, like, uh, for instance, also the Milky Way, are one of the possible uh, uh, categories of, uh, of galaxies. And they are, if seen uh, from a side, they are essentially a disk of stars uh, with, uh, hopefully, a slightly symmetric uh, bulge at the center, where most of the matter is contained. And they rotate uh, in uh, one direction or another. So if I see it uh, from above, uh, you can think about it as a bulge of stars uh, at the center, very dense, uh, with a possibly a supermassive black hole at the center. And then uh, arms, uh, like these ones here, that rotate uh, in one direction or another. I'm putting this convention in this way, but if you look at it from below, it would be the other way around. So in the case of the Milky Way, for instance, we are in such a configuration, and the sun is sitting somewhere here 
midway between the center and the, and the periphery of the star of the galaxy I itself. So these galaxies uh, turn around, uh, rotate, and we can measure their rotation mm, as a function of the difference uh, of the distance from the uh, from the galactic center. So along this uh, uh, this radius, <coughs> how do we measure this this thing? Well, essentially by Doppler shift. So we look at uh, uh, say stars uh, located uh, in different positions uh, of the of the arms. Uh, so here, 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 and here. We look at the light that they emit, and uh, by Doppler shifting, we know whether they're coming towards us or receding from us uh, in the other direction, and uh, with which, with, with which uh, velocity, speed. I'm oversimplifying enormously. This is a whole uh, uh, field of, uh, of investigation, especially in the 60s and in the 70s. People are, are basically not using uh, gal uh, stars only, but also clouds of gas, uh, masers, uh, whatever, things I don't know anything about. But the basic idea is simple. So you just look at uh, Doppler shift and you understand how the galaxy is rotating. By the way, we can do this uh, for the Milky Way, and we, and we can do this uh, for ad outer galaxies, so for other galaxies. Typically, for the Milky Way, it's more difficult. Despite the fact that we are uh, close to it, so we can measure many stars uh, inside the Milky Way. Uh, for the Milky Way, it's more difficult because, indeed, we are inside. So some parts are screened, uh, and it's not, it's not easy to reconstruct um, the peculiar motions of, uh, of, of stars. So the, the, the better measurements come from uh, outer galaxies. For instance, Andromeda, which is the closest one, uh, just around here, and, and other ones. So I'm measuring the tangential uh, velocity, speed, uh, of stars, uh, so I can measure the uh, rotation curve of, uh, of the galaxy. By rotation curve, I mean essentially the following uh, plot. Uh, I put uh, as a function of uh, the distance uh, from the galactic center, so r is this, uh, I put the velocity of uh, rotation tangential, so in this direction here. Mm -hmm. So what you would expect, uh, very naively, is that uh, as you go farther away, uh, in the in, in distance from the star, you would expect the point to be measured. The points to be measured uh, something like this, right? And I will give you with the basic formula uh, later. L exactly like planets uh, turning around the sun. So n Neptune or Uranus uh, go much uh, slower than Mer Mercury because otherwise uh, they would fly away, since the sun is the fourth source of the gravitational <coughs> force. And instead, uh, the measurements. Uh, the actual measurements uh, tell us uh, that, uh, apart from some uh, mess at the beginning, uh, the rotation curves uh, are flat for this kind of galaxies, mm -hmm. up to a distances which are of the order of, say, 100 kiloparsecs uh, or uh, even more. So these are some examples that you can see there. So uh, the first one here, this is a cartoon in some sense. This is Andromeda, but the actual points are are scientific ones. This is the <coughs> uh, first, uh, car first uh, re actual measurement by Vera Rubin and Ford uh, in 1970, again on the Andromeda galaxy, M31. Uh, this is a particularly clean one that everybody cites uh, because it's uh, so neat. Uh, all the points are really well aligned. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it's some NGC 6503, uh, whatever it is. And this is the Milky Way. This is a recent work of last year, two years ago in which they try to reconstruct the rotation curve of the Milky Way, up to 100 kiloparsecs or so. So what you see is that uh, the rotational velocity, so the tangential velocity, which is plotted here, stays uh, roughly flat as you, go, uh, as you go to the periphery of the galaxy. Yeah? How many of these uh, have been measured? Like it, it, it's Galaxies? Millions? Or no, millions, no. As far as I know, no, no, none. I mean, it's in between. Uh, there is a famous compilation by um, Sofue and someone else uh, at the end of uh, the year 2000, I think, in which they have 120 galaxies. Okay. I might be wrong. I have a plot somewhere. In the notes, I put some plots. Uh. Because there's like one where it doesn't do this. The there are some exceptions, yeah, yes. Curious, there are uh, actually, we were supposed to have a talk about this yesterday yeah. at uh, IAP, yeah, but we didn't. Yeah, I would consider those as uh, zoological uh, cases. I mean, some, some exceptions, yeah, yeah, but. Okay, so it's Hundreds. Hundreds. Okay. Hundreds. I would say hundreds, yes. Possibly more than that, but yeah, uh, yeah. with this precision, probably hundreds, yes. So <coughs> this is uh, evidence by itself, right? So the fact that uh, 
it's actually written in the plot. The fact that uh, you would expect uh, the uh, rotation curves uh, to go down uh, as uh, this, as this, uh, as uh, you move far away from the center, uh, it's not fulfilled. Uh, so that means uh, that there is uh, some extra matter, invisible extra matter, which is providing the additional gravitational pull uh, that you need in order to keep uh, those uh, galaxies uh, far away at the periphery from escaping since they turn so fast. It's extremely intuitive and extremely simple. But that's it. So actually I can do the, the kindergarten uh, Newtonian mechanics and say that, OK, so let's take a star which is uh, located uh, somewhere uh, here, close to the, to the, to the end point, uh, to the periphery of the galaxy. <coughs> so I can uh, equate the say it's star over mass m, say I can equate the, the centrifugal uh, force, uh, which is uh, this one, divided by r. So it's located at a distance uh, r from the center. So this is the centrifugal force that it feels, uh, which is uh, to be, in order to, to, to for it to stay in orbit, it must be g newton, so equal to the centripetal attraction, m of r divided by r squared, right? So this is the mass. Uh, of the galaxy enclosed within the radius r. And that tells you that uh, oh, the velocity goes uh, with uh, m of r divided by r square root, right? So indeed, the 1 over r that we expect. So let's say. Now, let's put myself, uh, I put myself uh, at a distance uh, such as uh, all the visible mass uh, is enclosed in the radius r. So say this is Andromeda, I put myself uh, here, I consider one of these stars here. So all the mass is included uh, at a smaller radius. Uh, so essentially this one is a constant and this is the mass of the galaxy, mm -hmm. the total mass of the galaxy. So I would have uh, that this should go with uh, 1 over r uh, times, uh, times constants. Gauss theorem tells me that everything which is contained counts as a constant, of course. And so I would expect to see something that goes uh, this way, 1 over r. But instead I find something which goes uh, constant. So that means uh, that this uh, mass, uh, which is acting gravitationally, is not only the one which is concentrated in the center of the galaxy, but is uh, distributed also much farther and uh, contributes uh, to, the, to the gravitational pull. So if you add... Uh, uh, invisible mass, uh, you learn uh, that, uh, so this um, m of r, you can write it as uh, the contained mass, uh, the enclosed mass, uh, so it's the integral between 0 and r of the density as a function of the radius. Uh, mm? So this is the mass contained uh, within uh, <coughs> a, a radius uh, r, assuming a, constant, as, assuming a certain density uh, rho of uh, r prime. And if uh, it's, it's a matter of two seconds uh, to understand that if you want uh, Vc to be constant, so if you impose uh, that this is a constant, as you see from the measurements, then uh, you get uh, that uh, m of r should go with uh, r. And that means uh, that rho goes uh, with 1 over r squared. OK, so the, the, this uh, additional substance uh, is uh, distributed uh, with a typical uh, profile, which is of the order of, uh, which is uh, like 1 over r squared. So it decreases as you go farther away. Um, and it provides uh, the extra gravitational pull that you need in order to keep uh, this constant uh, velocity up to very large distances. It's really uh, Newtonian uh, kinematics, very, very simple. Now, the typical questions are, are these curves always really flat, or do they go up a bit, down a bit? Uh, so what is this? Uh, so it, first of all, this is clear, no? I guess there is no, no doubt, OK. So the typical questions that people ask, well, first of all, the first one is, uh, well, at some point, uh, also this uh, should finish. I mean, at some point, the halo should also finish, and we should see something uh, going down. I mean, the velocity cannot stay constant uh, forever. Otherwise, uh, it means that this uh, su substance is uh, extended uh, at enormous distances. Yeah, that's right. But there are no uh, tracers uh, as you go farther and farther out in the galaxies. So typically, there are no examples that I know of, maybe some, but in which you see a turning down of this uh, rotation curve. So it's fine to consider them flat, at least uh, for these purposes. 
the other thing that people often ask uh, is, uh, uh, well, okay, but uh, it's suspicious that uh, I get something which is flat and not rather something like this or something like this. And uh, uh, even, I mean, the, the argument of uh, needing gravita extra gravitational pull uh, could work also for something that is slightly more bent in one direction or another. But this boils down to the fact that uh, uh, the profile of the dark matter is, uh, turns out to be 1 over r squared. And this comes out actually from uh, uh, computations, uh, naive computations. So if you put a gas of dust particles and you let it collapse, uh, in the very simplest uh, examples, in the end, you will get uh, a, a blob with a density that goes with 1 over r squared. So it's consistent with what uh, you would expect from uh, from standard uh, from standard computations, it's uh, in some sense uh, not a miracle, but something that comes out from that property there. <coughs> okay, so let's move on to the second case, to the second uh, probe, which is uh, clusters of galaxies. <coughs> So historically, clusters of galaxies have been the first systems uh, that showed uh, evidence for the existence of uh, this uh, weird substance called dark matter. And indeed, the first uh, mentioning of the word dark matter comes from a, pra a paper by uh, Fritz Zwicky. Uh, so this is clusters of galaxies. A uh, paper of Fritz Zwicky in uh, 1932, which uh, uh, did the computation that I'm going to discuss uh, in a minute. And he is the first one that wrote uh, dark matter in German, so I'm not going to, to repeat it uh, for the first time in the, in the, in the physics literature. <coughs> so about clusters, uh, while, while sorry, these uh, uh, kind of probes, uh, rotation curves of galaxies, date back from, uh, as we see there, date back from the 70s, uh, basically 60s and the 70s. And the pioneers of these are essentially Vera Rubin and uh, others. Uh, uh, who, who measured the first uh, these this, uh, this curves uh, with precision. <coughs> That's because just because that in the 70s, uh, measurements of Doppler lines and so on became precise enough to get these kind of things. So at essenti essentially, from 1932, nobody paid attention to, to Zwicky and his proposal of having some dark matter, while uh, in the 70s, people started taking it seriously because actually, it was clear at some point that the amount of matter, the hidden matter that you need here is the same as the amount of hidden matter that you need there. And so there was a sort of coincidence of different scales and people started to taking this more, more seriously. So there are two things that I can discuss about clusters. The first one is, uh, uh, is uh, connected to the virial theorem. It's written there to the virial theorem. So let's first uh, discuss that. So this is very simple again. So the Virial theorem is a simple theorem in uh, Newtonian mechanics that tells you that uh, <coughs> in a system, which is, so we are we're talking about a cluster, right? So a gravitationally bound system with the typical size that I give there of n bodies, where n is 100, 1,000 or something, uh, connected to, the, to each other by gravity. So a gravitationally bound system. And let's assume that this body, this uh, blob, this cluster, is uh, uh, bound since a long time. So in some sense, it's uh, relaxed. Uh, there are no galaxies uh, flying around, uh, but it's uh, a sort of self-sustained self uh, body. And let's assume that it's more or less, uh, I don't want to say spherical, but let's say isotropic. So there are no special, direction, special directions, uh, spatial directions uh, in, uh, in it. So something uh, relaxed in some way and isotropic. OK. So if this uh, holds uh, for a cluster, uh, for, for uh, yeah, a system, in particular a cluster, the Virial theorem tells you that uh, the average kinetic energy of the bodies uh, inside the, the cluster should be of the order of 1 half times minus 1 half tim times uh, the average potential energy of the, um, of the bodies in the clusters. 
So this is uh, really simple. Uh, I mean, you find the derivation also in Wikipedia. It's uh, nothing special. Just this one half comes from uh, the conservation of some quantity. <coughs> Anyway, it tells me that the kinetic energy, roughly the kinetic energy should be at the same order of the average potential energy of the, of the bodies in the cluster. So let's write it down for one specific cluster. In particular, Zwicky considered the coma cluster <coughs> in, uh, in, 19, uh, in his paper of 1932 and in follow-up pa follow papers. So for the, 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 the argument is very simple. So I'm going to consider that this cluster is made of, uh, say, n galaxies big n galaxies, <coughs> each one with a mass m, whatever it is. I mean, more or less all of them of the same, uh, of the same mass. We'll see that that's these actual numbers are not particularly important. So the total kinetic energy of the, of the cluster is uh, 1 half uh, mv squared, where v is the typical velocity of the galaxies uh, in the cluster, m is their mass, uh, times n. So this is the total energy, total kinetic energy in the, in the cluster for all the bodies. Must be equal to minus 1 half uh, total potential energy. So let's write down the potential energy felt uh, by a single galaxy. So it's G Newton m squared divided by R. r. Mm. So this is the potential energy of a single galaxy <coughs> uh, from all the n galaxies uh, surrounding it, right? And then I want to compute the total potential energy. So I multiply by the number of total galaxies n divided by 2 because I don't want to do double counting. So this is uh, the virial theorem for this uh, toy system of uh, n galaxies all with the same mass m. Now just do the computation. 1n uh, goes away, 1m goes away, 1 half goes away, and you get that mv, no, sorry, mn, so the total mass, is equal to 2rv squared divided by uh, g. Newton constant. So I can uh, weight the total uh, mass of the cluster and galaxies of mass m by looking uh, at the typical size of the cluster, the typical velocity of the galaxies which are going around, and the rest are constants. Right? So I can tell you how much mass there is in this cluster looking at uh, the size and the, uh, the, the, this, this, yes, the size and, uh, and the typical velocities. In some sense, I'm doing something similar to the rotation curves, but at the scale of uh, clusters and not with an organized motion, but with a, a random, uh, random motion of these galaxies. So let's put in numbers. For the case of uh, the coma cluster, we are talking about uh, a size of uh, 10 to the 6 uh, light years. This is just how big the cluster is. It should correspond to more or less what I said there. Yeah. And uh, we can look at the velocity of these galaxies, and you would typically find that these uh, go at uh, velocities of 10 to the 3 kilometers per second, roughly. And uh, G Newton is whatever it is, 6.6 uh, 10 to the minus 11 uh, meter second kilogram. So in the end, uh, you get that for the case of the common cluster, the total mass uh, that you, could ex you expect to, to see in the cluster is uh, 3 10 to the 44 kilograms. I converted it to kilograms just for fun. Okay? So this is the mass that you can measure due to the kinematics, Newtonian kinematics. And let's look at the galaxies itself. Let's look at the, <coughs> at the cluster itself. So Zeke did the computation. He was looking at the galaxies. So, that, so there are about 800 galaxies. So n is equal to about 800 visible uh, galaxies. Each one, he, each of them, he estimated, has a mass of about 10 to the 9 solar masses, given the light that they emit, uh, and so on. And so if you do the computation, this equals 3 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the 42 kilograms. Okay? So this is the number that we get from the Newtonian kinematics of galaxies going around, thanks to the Virial theorem. This is the visible mass. And the difference is about the factor of 100. No? So there is a 100 more mass, gravitational mass, than visible mass. With mass which is not visible, let's call it dark, dunkle materie, and that's dark matter, right? 
So actually, I think in the end, uh, he had numbers slightly wrong in the sense that the Hubble constant was not known very well at the time, actually had just been discovered. I think he found a factor of 400, but roughly we are more or less in the same, uh, in the same ballpark. So number two, clusters tell us uh, that there is more matter than visible by a big factor. Now I should talk about lensing. But yeah. It's this much bigger than the numbers you have done in the yeah, previous a, Yes, uh, much bigger than the five uh, that I gave at the beginning. Yes, I mean, five is the overall, uh, the overall uh, uh, average over the whole universe that we get from cosmology. But in bound systems, uh, it can be 100, it can be less, it can be more. So typically, for hmm? the Goma cluster, it's around 100. It's around 100. For other clusters, it's also typically around that, uh, that, uh, that amount. In individual galaxies, uh, it depends because it's not so easy to, to compute uh, the total mass. For the Milky Way, you have a factor of, uh, I, don't, I, don't remember, I don't remember exactly. Since I'm recorded, I want to say 50, possibly. So it varies. But uh, maybe you could. One could say that uh, in the cluster, <coughs> inside clusters, there is also a lot of gas, gas which yes. is also not inside the galaxy, but in between. Yes, I think that, that yeah, so this is accounted for, I mean, this is uh, historical in some sense. So I'm giving the historical uh, uh, replica of uh, the argument by Zwicky. And as I said, uh, these two first are essentially anecdotal ones at the, for the time being. But yes, you can account for that. Still, the discrepancy remains. The lower factor, but it remains, yes. Should we make a short break? Uh, or yeah, and then we go on. <coughs> OK, so <coughs> we need to talk about the second uh, proof uh, at, uh, at the um, scale of galaxy clusters. So um, this is actually more uh, pictorial and uh, more uh, cartoonish. So I'm going to use lights mostly. But let me first write down what I mean. So we are talking about uh, uh, weak lensing. So we're talking about uh, probes uh, of the existence of uh, some uh, invisible mass uh, due to weak uh, gravitational lensing. So the, the one of the chief, uh, um, one of the typical pictures that you look at, that you see when you're talking about dark matter is this one. I'm sure that you have seen it already on uh, Le Monde or New York Times or whatever. Mm? What is this? This is the so-called bullet cluster the, um, measured and discovered by NASA uh, NASA group uh, in uh, 2006, and it's uh, giving us uh, the aftermath. So this is the picture, say, of uh, the aftermath of a collision of two clusters of galaxies uh, that happened, uh, I don't know, a few million years ago, 150 million years ago. This is somewhere uh, in outer space. Uh, uh, this thing has been measured. So we are looking at uh, a cluster of galaxies, which is uh, located here. I will tell you later what the false colors are and everything, but let's look at the Galaxies, a bunch of galaxies which are you here. Use the point, the physical point. I use the physical pointer, yes. Yeah, I don't so, uh, this is a cluster of galaxies, the bullet indeed. Uh, you can l count here, I don't know how many tens of galaxies. And this is the other cluster of galaxies, the target, if you want. So, the bullet went through the target and passed it uh, through. Mm. So, there is even a movie that someone has produced, uh, the Chandra. Uh, in research Institute. So this is the bullet cluster which is going through the target cluster. And I'll tell you later what the false colors is, but this is just to give you an idea. They go through each other and what you get in the end uh, is this image uh, like the one that we saw, uh, that we saw before. Mm. So this is a simulation that uh, re re reproduces uh, the actual observ observation which is this one. What are we looking at here? So we're looking at three different uh, things uh, superposed. Optical uh, emission, X-ray, X-ray emissions, emission, and uh, uh, dark matter that I will tell you later how we measure. Well, actually, with this, so the optical thing uh, are just the clusters of galaxies measured by the Hubble uh, Deep uh, Field Space, tel Space Telescope. So this is the bullet, and this is the cluster. Uh, this is the target. So on this scale, uh, essentially, the two clusters uh, are just uh, a, a bunch of like a bunch of grain of sands. Mm -hmm. So the two clusters uh, went one through the other. And apart from a little bit of gravitational interactions, uh, essentially galaxies didn't feel, each, didn't feel each other, went through and uh, moved on the other side. Mm. So it's like uh, you throw a bunch of uh, uh, small uh, rocks uh, from two kilometers apart. Uh, in the end, it's very unlikely that two rocks will hit each other. So you get uh, something that passes through and go to the other side. Fine. This we understand very well. 
But the clusters of galaxies are also accompanied, as we were actually mentioning before, by <coughs> clouds uh, of gas, so ordinary gas, I'm talking about hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, helium, uh, whatever, which uh, in the collision actually slowed down a little bit, uh, heated up because of the friction of the two of the collision itself, because two clouds of gas feel each other by electromagnetically just. And so slowed down, heated up, and uh, by the excitation are now emitting uh, X-rays uh, that we can measure with uh, X-ray telescopes, uh, Chandra, and so on. <coughs> so indeed, you see that this cloud uh, that was uh, accompanying this cluster is a little bit lagging behind, and this cloud is a little bit lagging behind and actually also has a, a shock shape uh, because it went uh, through the other one. So by measuring the X-rays uh, emitted by this system, we can see that there is optical, uh, that there is uh, ordinary matter, hydrogen, helium, whatever, concentrated in these regions here. But uh, there is another uh, substance uh, that is uh, concentrated instead uh, here, which is uh, dark matter. So how do we measure that? We measure that by weak lensing. So here is just a cartoon picture, so don't be offended if, uh, if you study this in detail. It's just the fact that uh, the light of the images of background gal galaxies, so something else uh, much farther away, is uh, distorted uh, statistically <coughs> Uh, by the fact that there is a, a lens in the middle mm, and so the, the, the images, the, la the rays of light are distorted and we see a statistically significant uh, uh, deformation of the background images, images that allows us to measure, to locate, first of all, the cloud of invisible mass and measure its, uh, its quantity, its amount. Mm. So basically what I have is that in a system like this I can uh, tell apart, uh, separate in space, uh, really clearly, different kinds of matter. So the optical one, the galaxies, which are just a speck of uh, matter, like not particularly important, ordinary matter, baryonic gas, uh, and uh, something else, uh, which is located uh, at different, uh, different space, at uh, different uh, positions. So this cannot be ordinary matter, otherwise it would be here and would be shining, but still uh, it produces uh, a gravitational uh, effect, a very important gravitational effect, uh, which is uh, visible through the uh, gravitational lensing. So this is the propaganda image uh, that goes on newspapers. Uh, this is the actual figure from the, from the, from the paper, <coughs> which is superimposed, hopefully, exactly to the one before. So you see, this is, these are, this is the X-ray emission from Chandra. These are the weak lensing measurements. Uh, and you see that they are clearly uh, apart. So these kind of systems uh, are telling us that uh, there are two kinds of matter, baryonic and uh, non-baryonic. Both of them are providing gravity, but this one uh, made of ordinary gas and this one made of something uh, weird and, uh, and peculiar. So from, Im from images uh, like, uh, like uh, these, uh, we, we learn, um, so first of all, this is one. There are now 72 more uh, clusters like this, uh, which have been uh, collected, uh, called with different names like uh, the train wreck cluster or uh, whatever, and the ring of dark matter, whatever. And now the, 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 the picture is particularly solid and particularly, <coughs> particularly uh, clear. So this gives you an evidence for the existence of this kind of stuff at uh, the order of seven or eight sigmas, if you want something more, uh, something more precise. Yeah? Uh, I have a stupid question. Does the, say, the center of this uh, green uh, lines, uh, which is the dark matter, coincides yeah. with, the yes. with the center of the... Yes, yes, with the center of the galaxies. Yeah, yes, okay. but if you, yes, but if you measure the amount of matter that you need there, uh, you see that it's much, much more than what you see visibly in the, in the, in the galaxies, in the meeting, uh, which goes back to this argument, if you want. But here, the important thing is that uh, we are separating, uh, sorry, separating uh, uh, baryonic mass, baryonic gas, from uh, uh, non-baryonic gas, which is the dark matter. And, yeah. and more of this also evidence for the non-interaction of the dark matter. Yeah, indeed. So, indeed. No, so, this is what I was going to say in, uh, exactly now. Uh, so, but I forgot the actual number. So, I think it's uh, 0.1 picobarn, but 0.1 barn. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it here. So, because as, as, um, as he was saying, uh, let me look at, uh, at it very quickly. So this tells us that, that there are two kinds of matter, as I was saying uh, previously. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and this also tells me that uh, the dark matter, whatever it is, the clouds of dark matter, 
uh, didn't collide with each other, right? And so they pass through without interruptions. And this goes back uh, to the case of, uh, to the sentence, uh, to the statement I made at the beginning, uh, that dark matter is uh, very feebly interacting with itself uh, and with ordinary matter, or collisionless. If you, wait, if you want to be more precise, uh, the bounds that you get from systems like this, uh, from the collection of 72 ones that I mentioned, is that the sigma, so the interaction of dark matter divided by the typical mass uh, of the particles of dark matter, <coughs> so this is a sigma, say, self-interaction, has to be smaller than uh, roughly, I think the actual number is uh, 0 0.4 centimeter cube, uh, uh, centimeter squared per gram. Or if you want to put it in more particle physics units, uh, it's uh, one, around one uh, uh, millibar per uh, GV. So it's an upper bound. Dark matter cannot interact more than that. Otherwise, it would slow down and uh, collapse at the center in some way. It's not a particularly strong bound. Eh? I mean, if you look at it, uh, this is more or less uh, the same uh, intensity as uh, two protons colliding, not due to electromagnetism, but due to the, to the strong interaction. So it's not particularly strong bound, but this is what you get from, the, from these systems. <coughs> OK, so this is the pictorial, uh, pictorial thing. And now we move to more serious things. Sorry, just to yeah. <coughs> Gas yeah, yeah. Uh, ah, the mass of the gas? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, uh, also in yes uh, uh, so I don't have the number in mind, uh, so how much uh, gas with respect to dark matter you have in this, uh, from this image? Uh, yeah. Yes, I can look at it. Yeah. Yeah, sure, you can measure both things. Uh, yes. I don't remember exactly now. OK. OK, so now let me move uh, to the uh, third topic, uh, which is more uh, technical, but first, before moving into technical things, uh, I want to, uh, to give a sort of uh, cartoonish uh, overview. And the cartoonish overview is uh, uh, the following. So we're talking about uh, three, precision cosmology. So essentially, large-scale structure and uh, the properties uh, of the uh, CMB. So what I mean is uh, this. Uh, no? So if you look at uh, the whole universe, so you have uh, the distribution of the, of the galaxies and the whole observable universe, uh, for instance, measured by SDSS, the Galaxy, Galaxy Redshift Survey that maps uh, the, entire, the position in 3D, the positions of the, all the galaxies that we can see from Earth. And you have uh, the CMB, so the background light that is coming from us <coughs> since uh, uh, the time in which uh, photons uh, decoupled from, uh, from the atoms and, the, and, and from the baryonic matter in the early universe and atoms uh, started to form. Okay, so let's uh, have a look uh, first at this. Lar by large scale structure, I mean essentially the, the whole uh, biggest uh, structures uh, visible in the universe. So an image like this, uh, it's uh, not the most recent one, but almost the most recent one from SDSS a couple of years ago, <coughs> essentially reports uh, the position of uh, each galaxy visible in uh, uh, surveys, in astronomical surveys such as uh, this one here. So it's a 3D image uh, flattened on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the screen here. So essentially we are in the center here, not because we are in the center of the universe, but because we are observing from here. And each uh, dot corresponds to a location of a galaxy <coughs> somewhere in uh, farther in space, in redshift, and in the different uh, uh, angular, angular directions. <coughs> So the, the basic observation here, if you look at it, uh, just you stare at it uh, for a second, is uh, that galaxies are not distributed completely randomly. So they're not distributed completely homogeneously. And they are also not distributed in a few very condensed spots here and there and nothing in between. So there are structures, more or less at all scales, uh, like uh, this big wall uh, or these uh, filaments uh, or these uh, pancakes uh, or these uh, uh, cosmic um, web, as they call it, a spider web, as they call it. So there is, in some sense, a power at all scales. So there are structures at all different scales. What is the physical effect responsible for getting uh, this kind of structure? Well, not surprising, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, is uh, the presence of dark matter. Mm -hmm. 
So I will go through, through the details later, but just to, to give you an idea, uh, we can try to make some simulations, first of all. We don't know exactly where to go, so let's try first to make some simulations. So these are visible galaxies, but visible galaxies will sit in the locations of the potential wells dictated by the, uh, the presence of dark matter. So let me first uh, try to show you a simulation <coughs> made on a, on a computer of uh, um, N bodies uh, with the properties uh, of uh, dark matter particles. So the idea is, uh, I take a, a giant computer, this is actually an old simulation, there is a more recent one I will show you later. I take a giant computer and I put inside something of the order of a million or a billion uh, particles, in uh, quote unquote, uh, and I let it evolve from the beginning of the universe, say from a very high redshift to today, and I see what happens. So here I'm putting in only dark matter particles and uh, Newtonian gravity, nothing else and I'm letting it evolve. The initial distribution is uh, almost homogeneous, but not exactly, almost homogeneous, and I see what happens. So the simulation goes on, and as the redshift goes on, so as time passes, when we get to today, basically, so redshift zero, what we have uh, is that uh, the clumps have formed, so the overdensities have grown, and in the end I have uh, structures uh, which uh, resemble those that I showed at the beginning. I showed uh, two minutes ago. Mm? So what I'm putting here are cold dark matter particles in the sense that I'm putting uh, effective bodies uh, that have the properties of dark matter that are at the beginning. So something that interacts only gravitationally and uh, has the stable and with the good properties. The actual particles that I'm putting in are not really fundamental particles. They have a mass of the order of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5 uh, solar masses, so they are essentially like small chunks of galaxies uh, rather than particles. But the, that's because the resolution of these simulations uh, cannot be pushed too, too far. But the, the, the extent of Z is not the, the So the extent of Z is, I uh, say, this starts from, uh, from Z equal 30, but b because structures don't start to form much earlier than that, but I mean, this is just illustration, right? So the, the, the so let's say these, these, these uh, n-body simulations are interesting for the final result that you get, which is a, which is a distribution of, galaxy, of dark matter in galaxies uh, that I will discuss tomorrow, uh, next Friday. But I mean, for the purpose of uh, proof of dark matter, this is just an illustration. We'll go through the computation later. Sorry, do yeah. you use um, general relativity? Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, in, this in this kind of simulations uh, you are uh, factoring in the evolution of the, the, the expansion of the universe, so yes. this is essentially commuting scale, but it's not particularly relevant. I mean, essentially this is Newtonian gravity. You don't need much more, except for the expansion. No, for the expansion. Yes, but I'm not showing it in the sense that, okay, if you want, the, the, the box will, uh, will, ex will uh, enlarge. Actually, the next simulation shows uh, the scale which is enlarging, uh, but okay. Did I say something? Uh, no, it's, no. Just it's just Newtonian gravity plus the expansion of the universe. So you see that uh, this is another simulation that's a, a more recent one, uh, more detailed, uh, 10 to the 9 particles now. They have a bigger computer, that's it. Uh, and so what's happening is that you start from uh, the beginning uh, in some sense, uh, and then you start forming pancakes, uh, spider webs, uh, blah, 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 mm, clumps, uh, and so on. So here, these spots uh, are uh, clumps uh, of dark matter, these dark matter particles, uh, in false colors. Uh, and the idea is that uh, then in these uh, places uh, there will be a higher, a, a deeper potential well, and so ordinary matter will fall uh, and galaxies will be located there and will start, uh, will start forming there. So I don't want to wait uh, 13 billion years, so <laughs> let's cut it uh, and get to the, final to the end, uh, which is this one here. So basically, cartoonishly, the, uh, the idea is the following. If I show you this uh, famous image uh, from 10 years ago of simulations uh, and actual observations, you cannot tell the difference, right? So simulations involving dark matter on a supercomputer and uh, the actual structure of the universe, you cannot say which one is which. Can you? Well, you should because there is a simulation written here. <laughs> but <laughs> let's say they are the same. Statistically speaking, they are the same. You have walls uh, here, you have you have, uh, sorry, the, the point, okay. You have uh, filaments and so on and so forth. <coughs> so, that's the cartoon. Let's try to be, uh, so th that says that dark matter is an essential ingredient in the formation of, uh, of the large-scale structure in the universe, 
and now I want to be more precise and try to put it into to, to put it into equations. <coughs> yeah. Uh, did you get the same picture for if you try to go to smaller masses of the corpuscles? To smaller masses of the of the typical particles. Yes. Well, I guess, but you you cannot in the sense that yeah. uh, in the simulations, uh, I mean, it's a race and they are improving and improving and using smaller and smaller uh, masses and uh, higher and higher resolution. But for the moment, this is the the best you can have. So it depends also on what you want to simulate. So if you want to simulate an entire chunk of the universe, then uh, if you want to simulate individual galactic halos, then you can use smaller typical masses and you get uh, the distribution on the, size of, on the size of the galaxy, but you don't get the big picture in some sense. So by here, there are people which are much more expert than me on these things. Now I'm just uh, giving a cartoon in some sense. So, <coughs> yeah. No, so here I'm putting, um, in, in here, in these simulations here, which again are just an illustration, I'm just, uh, people are just inputting uh, um, dark matter, so a substance that interacts essentially only gravitationally. Uh, gravitational interaction, Newtonian gravitational interaction, nothing no else. No baryons. Now, the, in these simulations, in uh, more refined simulations that people are doing right now, since 10 years or so, people do act, uh, do in include baryons, uh, so they add baryons. Uh, and uh, they have a relevant effect, especially on, uh, on small scales, uh, which is still a subject of, of debate. So essentially, when you include baryons, uh, meaning essentially ordinary matter, protons, and so on, you start forming stars, uh, basically. When, st when galaxies form, you start forming stars. And these stars, uh, so they condense a lot, uh, because uh, ordinary matter can condense a lot and form compact objects, such as stars, and so on. And then these stars, at some point, uh, will explode, uh, doing supernovas, uh, and uh, re distribute the matter away. So there, is a, there are competing effects uh, between uh, the fact that uh, the added material that condenses a lot uh, produces uh, more gravitational interaction, so deeper potential wells, uh, and the fact that when they explode, uh, they uh, produce winds uh, that uh, blow out uh, the, um, the, the potential, so the, the ordinary and the, and, the, and the dark matter. So simulations are, in some sense, uh, at the verge of understanding whether one effect is more important or the other, and this is a whole industry again. Seems to depend on how much uh, baryonic matter you put with respect to dark matter in the galaxy. For hot dark matter, it's very For hot dark matter, we'll get into it uh, later. I have another movie that will show you that it actually doesn't work for hot dark matter. Here we are talking about cold dark matter only, plus uh, possibly baryons. Okay, so let, uh, let me try to go through the first one of these, uh, which is the formation of large scale structure. So <coughs> the idea is I want to look at the picture there, the picture uh, up uh, right, so the distribution of uh, galaxies in the sky. And, uh, and I understand and I see that there is a power on all scales in some sense. So there are structures uh, of different uh, uh, sizes from small ones to the biggest uh, to the biggest one. So what I can do to be more quantitative is that I can take uh, that uh, distribution of, uh, of, uh, of points there and compute uh, and, uh, and, and define the density perturbation, so the delta of uh, the position R, which is just uh, the density in position R, the over density with respect to the uh, average density of the universe. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking the average density of the universe, rho, or sometimes I will call it uh, rho zero, and I'm uh, computing uh, the uh, over or under density in a given specific point uh, R. Okay. And then I'm taking the Fourier transform of this. So I'm taking, uh, I'm computing uh, delta of k, <coughs> which is just uh, 1 over 2 pi cube uh, d3 r uh, delta of r OK, so I'm taking the Fourier transform of this, uh, of this quantity. So a large scale kappa, a large wave number kappa will, corres will correspond to a small uh, physical scale uh, uh, r, as usual in Fourier, in Fourier language. And I take essentially the uh, two point correlation function uh, transforming the Fourier space. So I, I define uh, the power spectrum, uh, which is uh, just Uh, 
OK, so this quantity pi, uh, p of k that I'm defining here is what it represent, is represented there. Uh, that is an old plot, but uh, historically it's interesting and it's a sort of a classic. So basically, that, that is uh, the uh, Fourier transform of the two point correlation function of the image above, right? So physically, what is it, what is it, is it telling me? That uh, <coughs> I have, uh, so this is p of k as a function of k, and it has uh, a shape uh, like this, uh, basically. So physically, what it's telling me is that, uh, so the physical meaning of the power spectrum is, uh, maybe you're very familiar with this, but just in case, uh, is that uh, when, for a given uh, wave number k, which corresponds uh, to a given uh, physical distance uh, in the sky, so a typical separation between uh, uh, two points, two dots in that, uh, in that uh, image there. If there is uh, a large power, it means that it's very likely to have structure, structures with that typical scale. If there is a uh, low power, say here, it means that it's unlikely to have structures with those scale. Okay, so this is a typical, the, I mean, the, the naive meaning uh, of the of the of the power spectrum. So we'll be particular. We can measure this power spectrum in different ways. So in particular, using uh, galaxy surveys uh, that will give me the green points uh, uh, there, or using other probes uh, such as the uh, Lyman alpha and other things which are listed there. So we can measure <coughs> this um, power spectrum of large scale structure over a range. Uh, of over a large range of kappas which are represented on that uh, on that plot there. So we'll particularly focus uh, on this region here, which is between uh, a wave number of the order of uh, 0.01 in units uh, of uh, h per megapar h divided megaparsec. So it's roughly the peak, uh, so the turnaround of the spectrum, and uh, here. 0.2 say h uh, over megaparsec why because okay so in this region here essentially the modes so the fluctuations of this typical size re-enter in the horizon later than matter radiation equality and uh, you, I'll tell you why this is important later so these are late modes and I don't want to consider them while uh, here the computations that I'm going to describe do not hold because this is the non-linear regime and so the linearization that I'm going to do next uh, is not going to work. Now, I know that here there are people who can actually work this out much better than this, but uh, for our purposes, this is Sorry, not uh, important. Right. How do you measure experimentally this correlation function? So you, you, take, uh, you, take, uh, you take that map, for instance. OK, but uh, so you have the delta of r, yeah, so you have delta r, you, do, you make the, 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 the two-point correlation function, and you do the, the Fourier transform. So basically, if you want, you take uh, a single distance r, and uh, a fixed distance r, and you look uh, everywhere in the sky when uh, it's uh, how likely it is to have structures uh, separated by this fixed distance r, which corresponds to a fixed kappa wave number. If it, you find a lot of correlations, then you have a high point. If you find a few correlations, then you have a, a, a low point. Is it more or less? Uh, it's two dimensional. This is three-dimensional, so it's three-dimensional in, uh, in uh, angular directions and redshift as well. And it's just two-dimensional because it's there in, uh, in on, a, on a page, say. Uh, just could you, could you explain what means uh, Lyman Alpha Forest? Yes, but uh, so Lyman Alpha Forest is another way to, to infer where matter is. And well, in two words, it means the following, that you have, uh, it means uh, that, that you are here. So this is the Earth, and you have uh, and you have uh, a quasar somewhere here, very far away, that emits lots of light, and in particular emits uh, uh, 21 centimeter uh, uh, at, at a 21 centimeter wavelength. Uh, it will uh, these photons will go through the matter which is intervening between you and, and there, in particular clouds of matter located here, clouds of hydrogen, say and can be absorbed. This light can be absorbed by the clouds of hydrogen uh, intervening in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the path. So you can, uh, by looking at the absorption, 
you can understand uh, how the matter is distributed along the line of sight. In uh, 3D, in the sense that, uh, so you're looking at there along the line of sight, in the sense that uh, since this uh, photon reshifts, uh, so lower its energy as uh, it approaches you, it's uh, emitted uh, at a different frequency depending on the location in which it is. So it's another way to say, okay, there are uh, blobs of structures uh, in the universe along this line of sight, and it can probe actually very small, uh, small uh, sizes, uh, so very high kappa, so very small sizes. Okay, so <coughs> the um, so uh, this is the power spectrum, right? So I want to reproduce this power spectrum. Actually, it's uh, convenient uh, to define another quantity just for for uh, our purposes, which is a uh, delta big delta of k, which is just a, a reshuffling of that thing. So kappa square p, p of kappa divided by two pi uh, squared, which is uh, depicted there. So you see that it's actually essentially this thing, uh, but just uh, remultiplied by uh, k cube, yeah. k cube, um, which uh, I mean you can show that this actually shows uh, the actual clumpiness in Fourier space, the actual clumpiness of the mass above. Mm -hmm. So you see that it grows like this, uh, and um, it shows that there is structure on uh, different uh, uh, scales uh, cap. So the, the basic point is that uh, you see that uh, there are structures for all uh, different wave numbers. How did they come from? Where did they come from? Mm. By the way, you also see that uh, when you go to larger, to large k, or the order of 0 0.2 here, delta becomes uh, larger than 1, which is essentially the statement that this, this, the spectrum is nonlinear uh, above, uh, be beyond that value of kappa. So the overdensity is larger than 100%, or delta is larger than 1. What is the red? Uh? The red is the surprise for the end. I cannot tell you now. OK, so let's do the computation. So I want to see how the, uh, the, um, the structures evolved, how the structures formed and grew from the early universe down to today. So in order to do that, uh, I have to consider the non-relativistic uh, fluid equations. OK, so let's, uh, let's assume that uh, I'm uh, looking at uh, a fluid, a fluid of uh, dark matter. And I want to see how the small perturbations in this fluid evolve mm, in the early universe and then down to today. So if I have a non-relativistic fluid, uh, which is enough for our purposes, this can be described by three quantities, essentially. One is rho, which is the density, which will be a function of the position in space and time. The other one is the velocity field, speed, or velocity. Actually, velocity, because it's a vector. I think uh, that's what the uh, convention says. And then uh, you need also an equation of state, uh, this omega parameter, which is defined as uh, the pressure divided by the density that I introduced uh, at some point earlier. But OK, this is not particularly important. So essentially, to quantify a fluid, you need these two quantities, the density and, uh, and the velocity. And you can write down uh, the so-called Euler equations, which are the following ones. So this is the continuity equation. Mm. This is, a, let's call it, a momentum conservation equation, or momentum equation. And then you need something that connects you to gravity, and that is the Poisson equation, which is uh, simply this one. G is G Newton, and the density rho. 
So this equation is just the continuity equation, which is telling me that uh, if there is a variation in time of the density rho, mm, so this is a derivative of rho with uh, partial derivative with respect to time, uh, that is due to a flux, uh, influx or outflux of, uh, of current uh, of the density rho. Okay. This is the conservation of momentum. So basically, this part here is uh, reconstructing uh, the variation, uh, the total derivative of the velocity. On, uh, so in time uh, and uh, in space, uh, and it's telling you that if, if the velocity varies, it's because of a pressure, gra pressure gradient uh, or uh, a gravitational potential uh, uh, gradient, gradient. And this is just the Poisson equation that is telling you that uh, um, uh, the gravitational potential is sourced uh, by the density rho. Okay. Now I want to linearize these equations and look at the first order perturbations. So I can just write down, uh, I can linearize the quantities rho and, uh, and v. So I'll write that rho is equal to rho 0 plus rho 1. This is actually the same that I called rho bar earlier. So this is the, the perturbation, the small perturbation on top of the constant density rho 0. So what did you write? In the Which one? Second equation. Uh, this one? Yes, second term. Is v dot um, gradient v. Okay. So this is the, um, these are arrows. This, uh, this is the nabla, how you call it? Okay, okay. So I write down that v is equal, rho is equal to this. Uh, v is equal to v0 plus v1. And then uh, p, the, the, the pressure is equal to p0 plus p1. This will not be particularly important. And the gravitational potential phi is equal to phi zero q plus phi, phi one. So these are the linear perturbations uh, <coughs> on these quantities here. And I also define uh, the sound speed. It will be later clear why I call this uh, the sound speed, which is uh, defined as uh, the partial derivative of the pressure with respect to that with respect to the density, which I can write as uh, phi one divided by rho one. So it will be clear later why I call this uh, speed of sound. But it's pretty clear that if it's defined in this way, then uh, the infinitesimal uh, variation of the pressure over the, over the density is indeed uh, the first order perturbation. So pi 1 divided by rho 1. It doesn't matter much. I mean, this is if you want to reconstruct all the, all the computations later. OK, so plug these into these exercise for this afternoon and what you get is uh, this so the continuity equation becomes this thing the momentum equation becomes this thing Poisson equation, it's uh, actually more trivial. It's this one. Okay, so from this to from uh, these uh, to that uh, is just a few rather simple passages. Uh, you don't need uh, absolutely anything. Just remember, if you want to reconstruct it uh, later, that these quantities are, are constant uh, by definition. So this is the homogeneous and constant quantities, and these are the perturbations on top of that. So if you derive this quantity in time, uh, you will get 0. So that's why this term uh, spits out only d rho 1 over dt, and so on and so forth. Hmm? So it will, hmm? it will depend on time, right? Later. But now, so, ah, did, I say, so I, I did, did I say expansion so far? No. So this is not in a non-expanding universe, in a static universe. Maybe I should have, so I should have said it. So this is a fluid equation in a static universe. Yeah, sorry. Later, we'll introduce expansion and to be crucial, but for the moment, this is all I have. So now I combine these uh, into, I want an evolution equation, so I want to combine them uh, into a second order equation. So I take this one here, let me call this one uh, equation number one, this one equation number two, and this equation number three. So I take uh, the derivative with respect to time of equation number one, and what I get is uh,
okay then uh, I use uh, number two which is here so I use uh, number two to plug it in here like you see that this one uh, can go in here and therefore what I get uh, is uh, that this equation becomes uh, this Okay, and then I can use n I can use number three because this one is nothing but this one, and so use uh, three to get uh, here. Okay, hopefully I didn't make mistakes. So this is the second order equation I was looking for. So the evolution equation that I was looking for, for the over density, the perturbation of the density uh, rho or rho one, which is also called the Jeans equations, the Jeans equation. Hmm? So what is this telling me? So it's telling me that, first of all, let's consider the case without gravity. So if I consider the case without gravity, it means that I remove this, this term, essentially, so g equal to 0 if you want, or the potential is equal to 0. So what, what remains uh, is uh, just a, a simple wave equation mm, for the density rho 1, for the perturbation of the density rho 1, that indeed moves uh, with the speed uh, vs. And that's why I called it uh, the speed of sound. So it's the speed of uh, a plane wave perturbation in uh, a plane wave uh, in the perturbation of the density rho 1. Fine. Now, let me add gravity. It means that this term is, uh, is also there, it's also relevant, and so in some sense, I have a competition between two effects. This term here, which causes collapse. So this is the uh, gravity terms, uh, includes gravity terms, uh, that uh, means uh, that the, 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 the over density will grow. So rho one be will become bigger because of this uh, uh, collapse term that I have here. And I have instead this pressure term here, so Vs contains the pressure, which tends to, uh, blow away instead the effect of the collapse. Mm. So I have a sort of uh, competition between uh, collapse and uh, pressure of these uh, perturbations in the fluid. So let me define the jinx length that I called lambda j equal to, um, uh, to this quantity, Bs squared divided by or pi g rho zero. So this is the typical, the typical length uh, at which uh, one term is more important or less important than the other. No? So you see that this is, so the, the, the scale of length that comes from the spatial derivative squared here, and the rest is just v squared, vs squared divided by this, uh, by this uh, other term on the other side. <coughs> so this is the, let's call it the jeans uh, length. And what I'm telling, what I'm saying is that this equation is telling me that, uh, I'm not solving it, but later we'll solve it, but for another case. This equation is telling me that uh, if uh, a typical length, uh, for typical length of the larger than uh, this quantity, larger than the jeans length, then uh, <coughs> the gravity term is more important. Just do your, your math. And then you have uh, that the instabilities uh, collapse. So the perturbations collapse and uh, grow in size. If instead uh, the length is smaller of uh, the jeans length, then you have that uh, pressure wins uh, in some sense. Uh, and so the stability does not uh, collapse. So perturbations with a length uh, larger than this typical length uh, are unstable, genes unstable, and they will collapse uh, and grow and become bigger and bigger. You can also define the genes mass, uh, which is just uh, very intuitively the mass contained within the genes length, uh, a volume with the genes length. So perturbations with a mass larger than this uh, will uh, collapse, uh, so they are unstable. But this is just a warm-up, uh, because we are in a static universe. Now <coughs> I want to move uh, to an expanding universe.
Okay, so let me go to an expanding to the case of an expanding universe, which is the actual case, no? That means that uh, the constant quantities that I wrote there, rho zero, v zero, p zero, and phi zero, are actually varying in time, as uh, Filippo was saying. So basically, I have that uh, rho zero is a function of time now, and uh, you can easily understand how it goes. Uh, so since I'm talking about matter, it evolves uh, with the scale factor uh, to the power 3. Mm? So this is just telling me that uh, the density, the constant density, uh, removing the perturbation, the constant density is a function of time, uh, and it's given by the value, say, today, uh, multiplied by the inverse of the square factor. It's just uh, like I was saying before. The density dilutes uh, as the inverse of the volume of the universe as the universe expands. A cube is the volume of the universe since A is the size of the universe, the scale factor. The velocity V0 also varies in time. So V is equal to <coughs> uh, Hubble law. The, the variation is given by the Hubble law. So constant, Hubble constant uh, uh, times uh, R, the distance. So this is just telling me that uh, like uh, galaxies uh, uh, which are uh, farther from us, uh, recede from us with a higher velocity because the, the, the constant of Hubble multiplies uh, the distance of the galaxy. Sorry, uh, and shouldn't, shouldn't you have the ratio A E T divided by A T zero? Yes, so, so this is uh, the definition of Hubble. A? No, in the previous... Uh, ah, yeah, so here it's, uh, here it's just a proportionality. Eh? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so this, is, uh, this is just is proportional to. I just need the fact that this is proportional to to a cube, sorry, inverse a cube. And then uh, the Poisson equation is just the, same, the usual one that doesn't change. Okay. So this one, this one, you can check that it's a, a, a solution of this quantity here, of this equation here. Mm, so if you just plug it in uh, into this one, you can check explicitly that it is a solution. <coughs> so now it's more difficult because I have to go through the perturbation equations for, I mean, I have to do the same passage from here to there, including the fact that these quantities can vary in time. So uh, I have to write this down. I hope I can make it in uh, five, ten minutes. Is that OK, Ricardo? Mm. So uh, the perturbation equations become the following one. D01 over DT. I'll write them down and then I'll try to comment a bit. Okay, <coughs> so you see that uh, if you compare these ones uh, with respect to those ones, uh, here the expansion of the uni universe is, uh, is evident because you have an extra term, uh, which is this one here, which, is due which contains h, which is the Hubble constant. So indeed, actually, these two terms, uh, which contain h, which is due to the expansion of the universe, and the rest is the same as, uh, as we had before. And the same uh, for these uh, uh, terms here. We have the same thing as before, times uh, two terms uh, that uh, account for the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, moving uh, from these, uh, from these uh, to these uh, is not completely trivial to my, to my experience. Uh, you need to go through a lot of passages, not forgetting all the different dependencies and so on. You have to do it this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will need uh, uh, the Friedman-Robertson-Walker equations, which I am not discussing uh, because I don't need them at the moment. Uh, both uh, the first one and the second one and you need to be careful in some sense but I mean 
it's straightforward with just some computations. Then uh, <coughs> you define, let's define uh, delta. So we are going back to the things, uh, uh, which is defined as uh, rho 1 divided by rho 0, or, uh, or rho bar. So this is uh, the overdensity of the perturbation with respect to uh, the, the, um, the, um, the constant density. And let's expand uh, all the quantities uh, in Fourier. Okay, <coughs> so let's move to Fourier space. I define delta of r as equal to 1 to 2 pi 3 Let me, let me uh, use this notation for the perturbation in Fourier space, uh, which is defined by this equation. And I include in the transformation, in Fourier transformation, a factor of A of t to account for the, to, for the expansion of the universe. So this is a Fourier with uh, a one of A at the, at the standard exponent. And the same thing for the other quantities. V kappa okay so I'm moving to the Fourier space and I'm now using the, these uh, three uh, quantities the delta I will be using these quantities so delta kappa V kappa and uh, phi uh, kappa the perturbation in Fourier space of the density of the velocity and, uh, the, um, and, the, and the gravitational field. This is a vector. <coughs> so now exercise, uh, translate these, uh, do the Fourier transform, and get to the equations uh, for these three quantities here. The result is uh, no, kappa is Greek. Kappa is, I'm, talk, I'm talking Greek, I'm not talking. Uh, yeah, K. K, okay, K. Oops. I hope you are not collapsing. Uh, there is some pressure sustaining you. Okay, so these equations are, oh sorry, here I forgot a dot. These equations are the same ones as uh, those, uh, but just for the Fourier quantities, where of course I define the dot to be uh, d over t. Derivative over t is equal to the dot uh, in uh, in these uh, in these notations. It's a delta k dot. Yeah, okay. delta k dot. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Shed. I mean, just to be compact. While here, instead, I keep the the yeah. d, t, d, d over dt definition uh, notation. Okay, so let me call these. Uh, Equations number one, we're almost there. Equation number one, equation number two, and equation number three, but the yellow ones. <coughs> so what do I do first? First, uh, I decompose uh, the velocity here, V of K. Actually, let me decompose the velocity, the perturbation of the velocity, V1, which is a vector, in the, the parallel, uh, parallel and uh, perpendicular components. So I can always uh, do that, and I will define in a second what it means. So v1 i can write it as v1 parallel plus d1 perpendicular where um, uh, these perpendicular and parallel are defined as uh, the fact that uh, the gradient uh, of the perpendicular component uh, is equal to zero so it's the so-called divergence free component uh, of the velocity and uh, the other one the um, rotation the how, how is it called? Rotation. Rotation. Yeah. Of uh, the parallel component is equal to zero. So this is the divergence free component, and this is the rotation free, irrotational component, rotation free component. 
if you do the computation, this just translates into Fourier space into saying that kappa or k dot v k perpendicular is equal to zero, while kappa k cross product v k <coughs> parallel is equal to zero. Okay, so this was the definition on V1, the perturbation in normal space, and this is uh, the definition in Fourier space. So I have uh, uh, two components, uh, the parallel and the, compo and the perpendicular for the VK component. Now, equation number two here is telling me, <coughs> equation number two is telling me that uh, um, uh, th let's say I can decompose it uh, in, the two, uh, in the two different components uh, and I have uh, that the first one is uh, given by derivative with respect to time of k perpendicular divided by time is equal to zero, right? Because you see that in the other two components uh, um, there, there is never, um, I mean, it always goes away if you decompose it in this way. You, you, you plug it in and you have kappas in and you see that this uh, never, never, never appears. So that means uh, that uh, the component of the velocity, which is uh, the perpendicular one, the, uh, the, um, the divergence free components, decays away. Mm? So decreases, uh, like, uh, I'm going a bit fast, but so this behaves uh, as one over a, if you do this, uh, simple differ differential equation. So it means that as the universe evolves, uh, this uh, component will die away and I don't have to care, to care about it any longer. So the equation number two, the other component that survives uh, is uh, this one here, i k v squared delta k minus i k phi k equal to zero. Okay, so this is uh, what comes out from equation number two for the other component of the velocity, the one that survives. Uh, so now I don't have to put a parallel or perpendicular any longer because just one survives. Uh, and I don't have to put the vector any longer because it's always parallel to the kappa vector, the k vector. And so I can just use uh, a single function, v of k, which is now a, a scalar function. So let me call this uh, two prime. Now let's uh, put this up. So now I want to do this. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you should write, uh, write it again. No, write uh, the, the blackboard. Yeah, you can. I can. Yes, you want, you can. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a derivative with respect to time. So you want to, now, now the point is that I want to, to um, where I'm going, I'm, I'm trying to recover a Jeans equation like the one I had before, but now for an expanding universe, right? So what I have to do is to try to combine these different equations, one, two prime uh, and uh, three, into a single second order differential equation. So uh, I can write number one as a simply vk equal to a delta k dot I k. This is just, uh, mm. and then uh, I input this uh, into prime. So I put this one v k into that thing, and uh, I use uh, number three. So I put v k into two prime and use uh, number three. And what I get is, uh, let me write it down and then I'll comment a second. A a delta k 
sharp i k So this is completely trivial, right? So I've inputted three, uh, which is written there to, to so first I, I, I in, in, in number two, I put this value for the k, and then uh, I input three in the last uh, term of uh, uh, equation uh, two, which is, uh, which is written there. And finally, I get to <coughs> what I was looking for. So delta k, two dots. Uh, so the second derivative with respect to time of the perturbation in Fourier space uh, times two h delta k dot plus vs k divided by a square delta k equal to zero. So this is the genes equation like the one that I had before, but in Fourier space uh, and in an expanding universe. So indeed you see that uh, with respect to the one that I had before, which I erased, so we are talking about uh, k quantities. We are in Fourier space, right? And there is this expansion term, which is, uh, which is uh, featuring uh, the Hubble constant. So exactly like before, I can define a genes uh, wave number, which is, uh, in this case, 4 pi g rho 0 divided by v, a v squared a squared. Right, so this is the value for which uh, one component, one term, or the other is, uh, uh, is relevant. K, K squared, yes, is correct, K squared. Yeah. <coughs> so if I am looking uh, at uh, K, so wave numbers, uh, so typical length, uh, inverse lengths, uh, which are much bigger than Kj, this wave number here, then uh, this, equation, this equation essentially becomes uh, uh, this term, this term, and this term. I can neglect this one. You, you can just have a look. Uh, this is simply what comes uh, from this approximation here. So the equation is delta k two dots plus two h delta k dot plus only the first term equal to zero. Now, <coughs> I am in, uh, uh, in matter domination, so I didn't give you any notions of cosmology, but uh, you are supposed to know that I'm talking uh, about uh, matter domination. And that means uh, that uh, uh, the, square, the, the, fi the scale factor of the universe goes with uh, 3 halves uh, T H0 omega matter to the 2 thirds. Okay, so in matter domination, so when matter is the most important thing, I will actually talk a little bit about cosmology next time. Now uh, it's late, but the scale factor behaves uh, with time uh, in this way. So times uh, to the power, time to the power uh, two thirds. And that also means uh, that the Hubble factor, which is defined, of course, as uh, a, a, a dot over A, is just uh, this quantity. It behaves with time in this way. So now, if you plug uh, this value for A inside this equation here, you get uh, an equation for, that I'm not going to write because it's late, an equation for, uh, for delta, delta kappa, delta k, mm, which I, you can completely solve as a function of time. Mm, so it's a differential equation in time for the quantity dk. Let me write down the solution. So the solution is uh, A and then uh, some quantities uh, that I'm not going to write down, kappa, uh, k, so this is uh, roughly the solution. I'm just writing down the important terms. Cosine, so it's an oscillating solution. Cosine of uh, 3 kappa vs divided by some numbers to one to the one third divided by t to the one third plus b another constant kappa and the sine of the same thing divided by t to the one third 
So basically what I'm telling you is that uh, this uh, perturbation delta k has a solution which is an oscillating one in time, mm -hmm. dumped in time with the, with the time at the denominator. So essential, essentially in this regime, the oscillations will never grow. They will oscillate. The, sorry, the perturbations will never grow. Delta kappa, delta k, will never grow. They will just oscillate in time due to this term and this term actually decreasing, whose amplitude decreases in time because of this factor t. Let me put myself instead in the other regime, which is the one in which uh, k is uh, smaller than uh, genes. So in this case, uh, I can uh, approximate the equation like this. Delta k equal to 0, OK? <coughs> I've just removed essentially the first term and kept only the second one because of this, uh, of this approximation. So we are still in matter domination. And so that means uh, that, uh, well, in particular, omega matter is equal to 1. I, I should have given some uh, cosmology definitions. Uh, I'll try to do it next time. Which means uh, that uh, you can reconstruct it later. Raw matter is equal to the raw critical that I defined uh, at the beginning today. Which means that rho 0 is equal to, you do the computation, you get something like uh, 6 pi over g, 1 over t squared. So you plug uh, these definitions in here, rho 0 into here. And again, you have uh, an equation that you can completely solve in time. There is nothing but a second order differential equation for delta kappa in time. And you get a solution, which is this term. Constant times t to the two thirds plus another constant times t to the minus one. So now I'm saying that uh, the perturbations of delta kappa grow with time. As time goes on, there is a, a, a term which is positive and uh, which is a yeah positive uh, exponent exponent. And so what you have are two thirds. What you have is that these equation these perturbations will grow in time. There is also a decaying uh, term that uh, decays away, but that I don't care. The important point is that perturbations do grow in time in this regime. So now I've gone uh, through half, half an hour of computations, and you are asking me, where is dark matter and where is baryonic matter? I mean, what is the features of dark matter here? Well, the point is that uh, if I have baryonic matter in the universe, if I have only baryonic matter in the universe, this baryonic matter is uh, tightly coupled to photons, right? Because it's uh, charged particles, essentially uh, protons, and uh, the neutrons which are together with the protons in the nuclei, and the electrons which are tied to the protons by electric charge. And these are coupled to the, uh, to the photons. Mm -hmm. These are tightly coupled to the photons, which means uh, that they have uh, a large speed of sound, because photons are relativistic, and so they have a large speed of sound of the order of uh, of uh, C, say, there might be a factor of a few here, but doesn't matter. So that means that I'm in this regime where I cannot neglect uh, this factor with Vs. So in, in the case of baryonic matter, I'm essentially in the first regime there. I cannot neglect uh, the, the speed of sound term, the pressure term, the term there. And so perturbations uh, will never grow. So I'll have something that oscillates but never grows uh, as time goes by. Actually, to be more precise, perturbations do not grow on scales uh, k, which are larger than uh, k genes. Uh, recover that thing, uh, which uh, if you do the, the, the proper computations, it turns out to be of the order of uh, a h, so the size of the universe, uh, the moving size of the universe. So perturbations do not grow on scales which are smaller than the universe at that time. If I said I have dark matter, then I'm the, in the opposite regime, because dark matter is not coupled to photons. Right? So I can write down that Vs is equal to 0. It's uncoupled to photons, and so its uh, uh, speed of sound is uh, uh, essentially 0. And so I'm in this other regime here, and so perturbations grow. 
with time as soon as we fall into the dark matter in the matter domination regime which is uh, which is this one here so basically what I'm, I'm finishing with this I guess basically what I'm saying is that <coughs> if in the universe I have uh, only something uh, which is baryonic matter then I'm in this regime and delta will never grow larger it will remain uh, oscillating uh, around a small value if instead I have another quantity another substance uh, which is uh, dark which is not coupled to, pho to baryons uh, to photons uh, sorry to photons then uh, I'm in this regime and perturbation can grow as a t to the two-thirds which is exactly what I'm showing there so these red lines uh, are what the perturbations do in a universe composed only of baryonic matter they oscillate but never grow while uh, the solution with dark matter is the line that we were seeing in the previous plot now rescaled and multiplying by k to the, k to the 3 which goes uh, through the data points here ok so you need dark matter to produce uh, the growth of perturbation that fits the data in terms of the movies that I showed before if you do a, if you do a, a simulation <coughs> with no dark matter but only baryonic matter what you get is something like this so this is a, a rough uh, but still correct uh, simulation including dark matter where you have the filaments, the pancakes uh, the, and so on if you put no dark matter but only baryons what you get is uh, very large clumps, uh, very dense clumps uh, at, that, at some specific uh, scales uh, reminding you of this uh, peaks uh, at some specific scales uh, and a lot of void in between with no structures uh, of intermediate scales mm? So this is the cartoon, this is the physics. In order to fit the data, you need dark matter, not just baryonic matter that doesn't allow perturbations to grow. Let's stop here. <laughs>